Tonight's presentation is titled, How Mags Work. And our presenter is Mike Bush. Mike is president of Savvy Aviation Incorporated, where he's also an author for numerous aviation publications. Mike has a certified flight instructor certificate, A&P mechanics certificate with inspection authorization, IA privileges, 2008 FAA's Aviation Maintenance Technician of the Year, a member of EAA. Mike, thank you so much for being with us tonight. I'm going to turn control of the presentation over to you. Okay, uh, great, Tim. And hi, everybody. Um, I've got a lot of material tonight, so um, the Q&A is probably going to be a little bit short. Uh, we This is a, like a, a two-part webinar. Uh, the webinar next uh, next month, uh, the first Wednesday of next month, is titled "How Mags Fail," and that one will will have um, more time for uh, for Q and A. Um, but in any case, um, let me get started here. Um, I fly this uh, Cessna Turbo 310 that I've owned since uh, 1987, so for quite a long time. And uh, it uses a magneto ignition system. And if you're flying a certificated airplane, the chances are pretty good that your airplane uses a magneto ignition system too. Um, you know, the fact that we are stuck with these very, very old technology mechanical black boxes is kind of a testament to just how hard it is to get modern technology FAA certified. Um, Magnetos were actually first developed for cars in Germany in 1899. Um, high voltage magnetos, which is what we use in airplanes, were first introduced in 1903. And they were used in, in automobiles, uh, Model T Ford, uh, automobiles like that. Um, but uh, magnetos were largely abandoned uh, in automobiles in the 1920s in favor of battery powered ignition systems. And uh, nowadays, um, almost all of the cars use electronic ignition systems. Um, electronic ignition systems or EIS um, are also used almost universally on uh, experimental amateur built aircraft. Uh, most of the RVs that we deal with and so on have uh, some kind of electronic ignition system like this EMAG. Um, but these things are pretty rare still on certificated airplanes. And the reason is because um, the FAR Part 33, which is the part of the regulations, it's called uh, Airworthiness Standards for Aircraft Engines, is, is a very, very, very old uh, part of the reg that has not been updated uh, for a very long time. And it's kind of firmly rooted in the dark ages. You know, the FAA uh, did a major update to part 23, which is uh, the, the part of the regulations under which general aviation airplanes are certificated. And, and they, they brought that into at least the late 20th century um, with, with this major rewrite that happened uh, a couple of years ago. But, um, Part 33, which is the part that has to do with our piston aircraft engines as certification regs, um, haven't haven't changed for, for a very long time. Um, and uh, so we, we now do have a couple of electronic ignition systems that have been STC'd for um, certificated uh, engines and certificated aircraft. But so far, the FAA um, is only permitting one of the two mags to be replaced with an EIS. And the second mag ha has to be a mechanical, an old mechanical tractor mag. They, they just apparently aren't trusting these um, electronic ignition systems uh, sufficiently to allow um, both ignition systems on certificated aircraft to be changed to an EIS, which seems uh, sort of boneheaded to me. Um, now, there are a bunch of different families of magnetos that are used uh, on our piston aircraft engines. Um, this is the, the the magneto that I use on my airplane. It's a 
there's it's a, it's a Bendix S 1200. It's a, a big gigantic uh, magneto. We'll talk about the different families of magnetos a little later, but these, are the, the, these mags are very large, very powerful, um, but they're basically indistinguishable from the, the mags that Bendix were, were building in the 1940s. Um, it's very old technology. So let's talk a little bit about the principles of how magnetos work. Um, a high voltage magneto is a self-contained ignition system uh, that converts mag, you know, mechanical rotation from the engine into high voltage pulses that are used to fire spark plugs. And it does so all by itself without the need for any external power from a battery or electrical system. Um, and they, the magnetos became the, uh, the ignition system of choice for aircraft engines uh, because they they don't depend on the electrical system and even if there's a total electrical failure the magnetos will continue to function and continue to keep the, the engine running um this sort of represents somehow the belief of the faa written into part 33 that um that an electrical failure uh, a total electrical failure is more likely than a, than a mechanical failure of magneto uh, I'm not convinced that's true. We we have quite quite a few mechanical failures of this magneto, and this is the sort of uh, this these mechanical magnetos, and that's actually what I'm going to be dedicating the next month's webinar to is to talk about all the different ways that these things fail. But today, um, let's talk about how they how they work, um, and I'll I'll kind of walk through the the critical pieces of a of a magneto. There's a lot of parts and in these things, if you look at an exploded parts diagram for magneto, it's uh, it's there's an awful lot of parts. It's pretty a pretty impressive and pretty complicated device. So the first part of a magneto that we'll talk about is the rotor, um, and the term magneto comes from this thing. It's a rotating permanent magnet assembly is the full name of it, but we usually just abbreviate that and call it the rotor. Um, and it's spun by the engine's uh, accessory gearing, and it's magnetized, uh, strongly magnetized. I, I sort of tried to superimpose a little bar magnet over that to, to illustrate that. Doesn't you don't really see that, but uh, that rotor is is a strong permanent magnet. Um, in a four-cylinder engine, uh, the rotor turns at the same speed as the crankshaft. In a six-cylinder engine, it turns at one and a half times the speed of the crankshaft, um, and the gears in the accessory case are set up to to, to turn the magneto drive uh, that speed, either either a crankshaft speed on a four-cylinder engine or one and a half times crankshaft speed on a six-cylinder engine. Uh, there, the Lycoming actually makes a an eight-cylinder engine, and in that one, the the, the mag turns uh, at twice crankshaft speed. Um, so this magnetized rotor is spun by the engine and it's spun inside of a big, um, uh, coil, uh, that, that has, um, uh, uh, magnetic poles made out of laminated sheets of, of, of metal, of iron. Um, and the idea is that when, when you rotate a magnet, um, inside a coil, it, it generates electricity, it generates an alternating current. Uh, so each rotation of the rotating magnet assembly induces two waves of alternating current in the coil, um, a, a positive uh, pulse basically and a negative pulse. Um, and both of those are used to fire spark plugs. So we, we fire two spark plugs per revolution of the crankshaft in a four cylinder engine, and we fire three uh, spark plugs per crankshaft revolution in a six cylinder engine. Um, the amount of energy that this thing can generate uh, is a function of basically two things. It's how, how strong the magnet is, uh, which sort of has to do with how big the magnet is. Bigger ones are, are tend to be stronger. And also how fast it rotates. The faster it rotates, the, the more voltage that the, the mag can, can generate. Um, I mentioned that my airplane has uh, 
Appendix S1200s. There's basically four families of magnetos that are used primarily in our piston aircraft engines, at least the, the um, horizontally opposed ones, um, Continentals, Lycomings, uh, Franklin, so on. Um, the S1200 in the lower left-hand corner is, is a big giant magneto. It, it throws a very hot spark. Uh, it, it's really the best uh, of, the, of the group. Um, but the problem is it's it's physically quite large, and and there are quite a few engines that where there's just not enough room to put a Bendix S1200. If if your engine is one that can accommodate a Bendix S1200, that's that's the best mag to install because it's the most reliable and it throws the hottest spark. Uh, ben, Bendix also makes a medium-sized mag uh, called the S20 or S200. Uh, depending on which of the two different starting systems that, that the mag uses. And we'll talk about the starting systems in a moment. Then Slick makes uh, uh, mags either 4000 series or 6000 series magnetos. And the, the Slicks are the smallest, physically smallest uh, mags of the group. And then finally, there is a, a, a mag um, that is uh, it was made by Bendix, which is now owned by Continental, and is used only <clears throat> on certain Lycoming engines. What's wrong with that picture? <laughs> um, and it's it's called a D3000. It's a dual mag, and, and and basically it's what it is is two magnetos in in a single case with a single drive. Um, there are a lot of us that think that the that this dual mag is bad news. It, probably shouldn't have been certified because it it doesn't really give you all of the redundancy that the regulations intended uh, when they require that, that the engines have dual ignition systems. Uh, and there are some single point failures of the D3000 that will take out both sides of the mag, not, not a good thing. But at any rate, it was certified. It's used on some Lycoming engines. If your Lycoming engine has a D on the end of its number, like an O320 H2BD or a TIO540 uh, um, uh, J2BD, the, the D at the end of the number means that the, mag, the, the, the engine is configured to use this Bendix dual mag. Um, and, and because it's made by Continental and because it's, uh, uh, it's used only on Lycoming <laughs> engines, uh, a few years ago, Continental said, well, Golly, why, why are we making these mags for our competitors' uh, engines? So they announced that they weren't going to support the D3000 anymore. And this has been a problem <clears throat> for owners of engines that, that have Lycoming engines that have Ds on the end. Um, there are some aftermarket components that are available to, to keep these mags running. But uh, typically, when these D engines are overhauled, there's, there's a pretty good um, incentive to. Uh, replace the accessory case at, at overhaul time with a different configuration accessory case that uses two conventional mags as opposed to one of these dual mags. Uh, so as I mentioned, you know, big mags like the S1200s on my airplane generate more energy um, because they have bigger magnets, bigger everything, uh, than smaller mags like the, the slick 4300, 6300. Um, but you know, as I mentioned, that there are um, some engines that simply can't accommodate a mag as big as the S1200. So you, you can't use an S1200 on every engine, but if if your engine is one that can accommodate it, it's it's pretty much the best magneto around. Um, even more important than the size of the magneto is how fast it's rotating. Um, magnetos uh, generate their maximum energy when when the Rotating magnet assembly is turning fast at you know at, at you know full cruise or takeoff RPM, and it puts out a lot less energy when the engine is at idle, and a whole lot less energy when the engine is being cranked to start. Uh, and in fact, when the engine is being cranked to start, they they don't put out enough energy at all to fire the spark plug. So you have to do something tricky, which we'll talk about. So that's the that's the rotor. Um, the next thing we'll talk about is the coil and, and breaker points. 
Um, here's a, a, a good picture showing the, the rotor and the coil and the pole pieces, how they're all arranged um, in a magneto. Um, and, and you can see on the front of both of those red coils is a, is a little terminal, which is the high voltage terminal where, where the, the coil puts out the, the, the high voltage that gets sent to the spark plugs. Um, so the, the, this coil has two windings, a primary winding and secondary winding. The primary winding uh, typically consists of about 180 turns of heavy gauge copper wire uh, wound <coughs> around a laminated iron core. Um, and one end of the coil is, is permanently grounded to the case of the mag. And the other uh, end of the primary is, um, is connected to the, the breaker points. Um, which basically open and close this circuit. So if the breaker points are closed, um, electricity that is induced in the primary by the rotating magnet can, can flow around and around in, 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 that, in that circle, um, which creates a magnetic field, a strong magnetic field in, in the core. So again, normally the points are closed which grounds both ends of the of the primary, and then when the rotor turns and generates a voltage in the primary, the voltage can can, can go around uh, continuously through this primary and magnetize uh, the, um, the the core uh, the, the the magnetic core. Um, so it it creates a, a you know a powerful magnetic uh, field in that core. Uh, but then when the magneto's cam opens the breaker points, which it does two or three times per crankshaft revolution, depending on it's a four or six cylinder engine. But when the, when the cam opens the points, it interrupts that flow of current, breaks the circuit, causes this uh, magnetic uh, field to collapse suddenly. And when it collapses suddenly, it generates um, a, a moderately high voltage spike in, in the primary, um, 200 or 300 volts, let's say around 250 uh, on average volts are, are, are generated, a spike of, of 250 volts are generated in the primary. Now the, the secondary winding, which is wound around the same core, um, contains a, typically uh, 18,000 turns of very fine magnet wire, so uh, around 100 times as many turns as the primary. Um, so these two windings act as a step-up transformer, and they step the, the primary voltage up by a factor of 100 in the secondary. So if, we're, if we open the points, generate a 250-volt spike in the primary, um, we're generating a, about a 25,000 volt spike in, in the secondary, and that's enough uh, enough voltage to uh, throw a nice hot spark uh, across the spark plug. Um, then there's a, a component in there called a condenser or capacitor. Both words are used, they're basically synonymous. A condenser is kind of an old fashioned word. That's what Ben Franklin used to call them. <laughs> when he was playing with, with kites and, and lightning bolts. Uh, nowadays, we tend to call them capacitors, um, but both terms are used. Um, and, and here's the purpose of, of, the, uh, of the condenser, the capacitor. Um, the breaker points are opened by the mechanical action of a cam. Uh, in this case, it, it's a two-lobed cam, and it, and it opens the breaker points twice per revolution of the crankshaft. So this would be in a, in a four, uh, probably in a four cylinder engine. Uh, but there's this, this cam that, that opens the points uh, twice per revolution. And as it starts to open the points during the first few microseconds that the cam is opening the points, 
the, the points are so close together that if we didn't do something to prevent it, um, that 250 volt spike would would arc across the points. And uh, arcing across the points would be bad because it would erode and pit the points so they wouldn't last very long. We'd have to keep changing the points a lot. And, and also the collapse of the magnetic field would be, would be slower um, uh, if, if the uh, arcing was allowed. And that would result in a, a weaker and sort of less predictable spark. So to prevent this arcing across the points as they are just starting to open, um, this condenser is, is put in the mag or capacitor uh, and it's wired across the, uh, the points. And what it does is um, at the moment that the points start to open, uh, the, that initial voltage spike uh, charges the capacitor rather than arcing across the points. And it charges the capacitor for about 50 microseconds or so until the capacitor is fully charged. Um, you, you control how long that period of time is by how large the capacity of that capacitor is. And so it's, it's tuned to just be about, to, to, to be optimum. Um, and so if that voltage spike is charging the capacitor, it's not gonna arc across the points. And by the time the, the, the capacitor condenser is fully charged, the cam has separated the points enough that the 250 volt spike won't be able to jump the gap and won't be able to arc and, and uh, mess up the points. So the, the, the capacitor is basically in there to uh, prevent arcing across the points, make the points last longer and, and make this voltage spike more predictable. Um, Sometimes these condensers go bad. They, they, um, they're, they're pretty much the only calendar time limited component in the mag. And uh, you know, they, they will go bad after eight or 10 years. And if they do go bad, the mag performance uh, degrades and the points get, get messed up. So we periodically, not too often, but we periodically have to change, uh, put, a, put a new um, condenser in the, in the mag to protect the points. And then finally, there's a, a distributor. Um, a distributor is very much like a distributor in old cars. It, it's, it's basically a, a metal wiper that rotates around and uh, transmits the high voltage to the appropriate spark plug. Um, and if you, this is, this is what the distributor looks like. If you open it up, the thing on the left side is called a distributor block. And you can see it's got some contacts in there that are actually connected to the spark plug leads. Uh, this one has four contacts, so it's for a four cylinder engine. And the, on the right is the, is the, um, is, is the distributor gear that has this wiper and that rotates around. Um, the um, and the, the distributor gear uh, rotates around at half at one half crankshaft speed. The, the gearing inside the mag uh, assures that it turns at half crankshaft speed. Um, the, um, the this metal wiper doesn't actually touch the electrodes in the distributor cap. It just comes very very close to them, close enough that the spark can can jump jump across, and that's why these kinds of these distributors are called jump cap uh, distributors. Um, and the, the, uh, the gear also has a, in the middle of it, it has a, um, a carbon brush that has a little spring uh, beside it. And that brush uh, presses up against the hot terminal on the coil. Uh, so that's how the, the high voltage from the coil uh, gets to that little wiper and then gets to the appropriate spark plugs as this thing is turning around and and uh, sending it to the to the appropriate spark plug. Um, so I think I said all of this. Okay, the wiper doesn't actually touch; it's a jump cap. Um, now, if you look at at this uh, gear you'll notice that it's kind of discolored and it looks like it's got, you know, some patches of carbon and stuff. 
th this gear um, needs to go. It's in bad shape. Um, here's what the gear looks like when it's new. It's not typically nice and, and white or maybe slightly cream colored. Um, but when the gear starts to get discolored and starts to, to get um, uh, carbon um, tracking on it, uh, it, it needs to be replaced. That's one of the things that we do at 500 hour uh, mag inspections. We inspect the, uh, the gear and replace it if it needs to be replaced. Um, and failure of the distributor gear. These gears in the mag are, are, are made of, of, of plastic. Um, they, have, they, can't, they have to be non-conductive. So they're made of plastic and um, they, uh, they, they tend to, uh, uh, to break after a while if, if they're left uh, in there too long. Um, and that can cause all sorts of terrible things that we'll talk about um, in the next webinar where we're talking about failure modes. Um, it's also really important that that everything inside the distributor, both the gear and and the and the block, be scrupulously clean, and not have any carbon tracking or or, or any uh, signs of, of petroleum uh, on it, because uh, any contamination in the distributor will allow high voltage to uh, to, to crossfire inside the distributor. Um, and uh, that, that makes the engine do really, really weird things because you're getting sparks sent to the wrong spark plugs. Then there's a thing called a P lead. Um, the P lead is, is, uh, is a wire that connects the ignition switch, which can be a key switch like this if it typically if it's a single engine airplane, or it can be uh, uh, toggle switches if uh, with the start buttons if, if it's a twin like mine. Um, but but basically the the P lead is a wire that runs from the ungrounded end of the magneto coil, uh, the magneto's primary coil, um, to the cockpit switch. Um, and so if the cockpit switch shorts the P lead to ground, that disables the mag. And that's how we turn off mags. We turn them off when we're finished flying, we turn them both off. We turn one off at a time when we're doing mag checks. Uh, we normally run them, run them on both. And in, in both, we're not shorting either of the P leads to ground. But if you switch the switch, say to, to left to L, um, which says you want to run only on a left mag, it shorts the P lead that goes to the right mag to ground. It, it, so it disables the right mag and you're running only on the left mag. And when you're in the off position, it, it, it shorts both P leads to ground so that both, um, so that both of the mags are disabled. Uh, the P in, in the term P lead stands for primary uh, because it's, it connects to the primary winding of the magneto coil. The P lead is normally a 16 gauge shielded wire uh, with the shield uh, grounded at the magneto end, uh, left ungrounded at the switch end. It's really important that the P lead be shielded because um, when the mag is running and not being shorted out, uh, that P lead would radiate um, high voltage um into the cockpit and create all kinds of noise in the radios and make dps's very unhappy and so on so it needs to be shielded in order to not radiate and and not mess up uh, avionics um because the p lead you know runs into the engine compartment and is connected to the engine and it kind of vibrates around a lot um it's not uncommon for the p lead uh, to 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 break um, often it breaks at, at the end where it's connected to the magneto. Um, and depending what breaks, it can cause various things. If, if the center conductor uh, breaks, uh, then you can't shut the mag off and you have a, a hot mag, which is a dangerous situation. So if you turn the prop, uh, somebody might get hurt. Um, also, you, 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 couldn't, you couldn't do a, a proper mag check uh, if, the, if the P lead center conductor is, is broken. Um, if the shield is broken, if it's, if it's ungrounded, um, 
then you, you get noise in the radios, you, you, you might get degraded GPS performance and so on. Um, but the, the key to that is, uh, is, is hearing noise in your comm radios. And then typically if you're in flight and you shut off one mag and then the other mag, um, and next time we'll talk about in-flight mag checks, um, and you discover that when you only run on one mag, the noise in the radios goes away, then you've sort of figured out that the noise is coming from the other mag and, and that it's an ungrounded shield and you, you need to go fix that. Okay, so let, let's talk about um, a problem here. The, the, the magnetos do a pretty good job of keeping engines running, but, it's, uh, but starting the engine in the first place is, is problematic. Um, getting the engine started presents two different problems. One is that uh, the mag, the engine isn't turning fast enough uh, to rotate the mag fast enough to generate enough energy to uh, to throw a spark. I mean, typically when you're cranking an engine with a starter, you're only cranking it maybe 50 RPM or so, and the uh, mag is not going to generate high voltage if you rotate it 50 RPM. Um, it uh, it the mags are rated with what's called a coming in speed, which is kind of the minimum speed that they have to be rotated in order to throw a decent spark. And the coming in speed for most mags is you know 150 to 250 RPM, something like that. Um, but it, at at the speed that the starter motor cranks, the the mag just isn't isn't capable of generating very much voltage. So we have to solve that problem. And then the other problem we have to solve is that. Uh, magnetos are have fixed ignition timing. We we adjust them uh, to get a certain ignition timing, which for most engines is a number somewhere between 20 degrees and 28 degrees before top dead center. The the ignition timing is always stamped on the engine data plate, um, and uh, at annual inspections the. Uh, the uh, mechanic always checks the mag timing, and if it's not very, very, very close to what the spec says, then you have to loosen up the mag clamps and rotate the mag a little bit to so that, to get the timing uh, correct. But if you're trying to start an engine at 50 RPM and you fire the spark plug at 20 or 28 degrees before top dead center, the engine is going to start; it's going to kick back. Um, because the engine's turning so slowly uh, that in order to start, you, you have to retard the timing to something very close to top dead center, not 20 or 28 degrees before top dead center. So in order to um, get the engine started, we have to solve these two problems. We have to coax the, mag, coax the mag into generating a voltage somehow, and we need to retard the ignition timing enough that the uh, engine won't kick back uh, while we're cranking it and trying to start it. And there's there's two different methods for doing this. Um, one is a, is a mechanical method called an impulse coupling. And the other is, is an electrical method, which is the retard breaker method. And I'll discuss both of those. Um, but which of these two you have depends on what kind of airplane you fly. Um, in my experience, almost all of the single engine Cessnas use impulse couplings. Um, a lot of the Pipers use impulse couplings. Um, uh, quite a few Bonanzas use the retard breaker system. And uh, the twin Cessnas, like the one I fly, uh, use the retard breaker system. So uh, you know, it just depends which of the two starting systems the aircraft manufacturer chose for that particular model. So we'll talk about the impulse coupling system first. It's probably the most common of the two starting uh, systems for, for magnetos. This is what an impulse coupling looks like, and it, it mounts on the magneto shaft, uh, and, it, and it connects to a gear that is driven by the engine. Um, it's actually a pretty clever device. It, it, it consists of basically four parts. There's a flyweight assembly with two flyweights that, that, that pivot on, on some posts in the flyweight assembly. And this flyweight assembly is connected to the magneto shaft. 
there's a, a body that is connected to the engine. And then there's a big a coiled up spring uh, that sits between the two inside the, that recess in the body um, and connects the, uh, the flyweight assembly to, to the body. Um, here's a, a diagram of, of how this thing is configured uh, on, a, on a slick uh, mag. Um, you can see the body, the coiled up spring. Uh, the hub, which has two flyweights on it. And, um, this, uh, th this diagram shows that, that the flyweights are uh, attached to the hub using a snap ring, um, but there's an AD that says you can't do that anymore because the snap rings had a nasty habit of coming off and dropping flyweights into the engine, which wasn't too cool. So uh, now if you have uh, one of these that, that has the, the snap rings, you have to change it out for a, another um, uh, impulse coupling that, that, that uses a rivet instead of a, instead of a snap ring. Um, but that's the, those are the components and then there's a there's a there's a trip pin that you can see in the, the very bottom of the screen. And so so the way this thing works and I, I wish I could show you a movie of it because it's a little hard to, to visualize but you start cranking the engine. It starts turning the uh, the housing of the um, of the Im impulse coupling, um, but the flyweight is hitting this pin, and so it can't move. And so th what the engine is doing as it's starting to turn is, is is winding up the spring. It's not turning the magneto. It's just winding up this spring. Uh, and it continues winding up the spring until uh, the the finger on the hub hits a little tang on the uh, on the flyweight and basically re releases it from from the pin. And now you've got this wound up spring that that snaps the magneto at a much faster speed than uh, what the engine is turning. Um, and it just keeps doing that as as you're cranking it. Um, uh, the amount of uh, rotation that that, that hub um, makes to wind up the spring before it trips the, uh, the flyweight and lets the thing snap is about 25 degrees of rotation. So this thing is doing the two things that we needed to do. It's delaying the uh, mag timing by about 25 degrees, and it's then snapping the mag fast enough that it can generate a decent amount of voltage even though the engine's only turning at 50 RPM, the, the mag it will turn a lot faster than that as the spring uh, snaps it around. Uh, so if, you're, if your airplane is one, when you shut down the engine, you hear sort of a, a click, 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 then you've got uh, induction couplings. And if you don't, then you have the other system that we're about to talk about. Um, some airplanes, like most single engine Cessnas, use induction couplings on both magnetos. So both magnetos uh, participate in the engine starting process. Uh, certain other airplanes, like a lot of Pipers, only use an, uh, an impulse coupling on the left mag and have a different style of mag switch, which when you turn it to the start position, grounds out the right mag uh, because it doesn't have an impulse coupling. So it won't, it won't work to start the engine. So you may have a, a, a single impulse coupling or you may have two impulse couplings. I'm not sure why. Uh, some uh, designers uh, use only one impulse coupling because it seems like it eliminates some redundancy, but that's just how it is. Um, now these these magnetos, as you can kind of get the idea, they have a lot of moving parts. Um, I haven't even gotten into all the moving parts uh, because there's that there's the there, there are some consumable parts or that 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 uh, carbon brush that that. Um, conducts the, the high voltage from the coil into the distributor gear. Um, that, that wears, of course. Um, uh, there, there's, there's lots of, um, of felt washers that need to be lubricated to provide lubrication to the mag, and that has to be done on, on a periodic basis. So both uh, Bendix and Slick um, say in their manuals that these mags should be 
taken apart and inspected um, every 500 hours. Um, and that inspection would include things like looking at the distributor gear to see if it needs to be replaced, looking at the condenser to see if it's getting too old, um, lubricating all the things that need to be lubricated and, and, and so on. Um, you know, one, one of the problems with magnetos is that there really isn't any good way to determine the magnetos condition without removing it from the engine and taking it all apart. You know, it's unlike the engine itself, we, we, we can't stick a borescope inside a magneto. We can't um, uh, check an oil filter on the magneto or, you know, do any of the things that we do to non-invasively to determine the condition of the engine. The, the magneto is pretty much a black box and there's really no good way of, of inspecting it without removing it from the engine and taking it all apart. Um, and that's, that's that's what we have to do every 500 hours. We don't have to overhaul it. Overhauling it would be more than that, but we at least have to do a disassembly inspection and lubricate all the things that need to be lubricated and replace things that seem to need to be replaced. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, there's several ADs against these impulse couplings for both Bendix and Slick. So that's something that needs to be done at, at each 500 hour. Now the 500 hour inspection is not an AD. It's not required by the FAA. And I see a lot of owners that, that, that don't do them and that, that let the mags go for a really long time without getting taken apart. But I, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a on condition maintenance guy, but in the case of mags, I'm pretty religious about taking them apart every 500 hours or sending them out to be taken apart because there's really no, good way to determine their condition other than by taking them apart. And they've got a lot of parts in there that, that have a history of, of breaking. Okay, so we talked about the impulse coupling um, method of starting, and uh, that's probably the majority of um, piston aircraft use impulse couplings. But uh, then there's this other system called the retard breaker a magneto or it was actually, uh, Bendix used a, uh, a trade name called Shower of Sparks, which you'll, you'll, you'll see why that is. And um, the, the way the, this retard breaker starting system solves the two problems is, is different than, uh, than the impulse coupling. Um, uh, first of all, in the left mag only, and, and these, systems start on the left mag only. In the left mag, there are two sets of breaker points. There's the main breaker, which is timed at the normal way, you know, 20 to 28 degrees before top dead center, depending on what engine it's mounted on. And then there's a, re a separate set of breaker points called the retard breaker, which um, is, is also driven by the same cam, but it's, it's located uh, so that it opens um, about 25 degrees later than the main breaker, which is about what the mag timing ought to be for, for starting, because we need to retard the spark. Um, so that's the way this system deals with the retarding the ignition problem during starting. It has a separate set of break, breaker points that are timed to, to do that. Um, but that still leaves the problem of how do we get this magneto to generate enough voltage to throw a spark if we're only turning the engine at 50 RPM. And so the way this is done in the shower spark system is with a, a, a gizmo called a starting vibrator. The starting vibrator is basically a, a doorbell buzzer. Uh, it's, it's more expensive than a doorbell buzzer, but basically that's what it is inside. And when it's energized by the aircraft's battery, it, it buzzes and you can hear it, hear it buzz if you listen carefully. And it generates a train of pulses uh, that are sent over a secondary P lead to the secondary, the, to the retard uh, set of breaker points. Um, so when you're cranking the engine, uh, this, this buzz box sends a bunch of pulses of power from the from the aircraft's battery uh, through the uh, 
the retard points uh, into the coil, and that's that's what generates the the hot spark. And it actually generates a really nice spark for starting because it, it because of the buzzer, um, it, instead of generating just a single uh, spark per uh, combustion event the way the mag normally does, when this buzzer is being used, it generates a train. Uh, or what they call a shower of sparks, which makes for, for very good starting. So he, here's a, a simplified diagram of what that looks like. Um, it, it uses the uh, voltage from the ship's battery, um, it goes through this doorbell buzzer. The, the doorbell buzzer has a, has a condenser in, in it, it to prevent arcing inside the, the buzzer. And then that, that the voltage from the buzzer, which is uh, which is a, a train of, of pulses uh, gets sent to the to the left mag coil um, if the uh, retard breaker is um, is uh, is open and generates that that spark. And here's here's a more complete diagram, and you can see that the start switch is a fairly fancy switch that has lots of wiring because it does a whole bunch of things. When you start the engine, it has to has to ground out the right mag. It has to connect the retard points from the left mag to the buzzer. It has to ground out the regular points on the left mag, you know, and, and, it, and it has to crank the starter. So it's a four pole switch that does all of those things. So the the uh, retard breaker system, the 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 advantage of it is is that it's it's more reliable and, and it eliminates the mechanical risks involved with impulse couplings coming apart. Um, and it pr produces easier starting because the spark plug fires a bunch of times uh, instead of just once as you're cranking the engine. The, the one disadvantage of the system is that it depends on battery power. So if your battery is completely depleted, you can't hand prop the engine uh, if you have a shower of spark system because there's just not going to be any starting voltage because uh, it depends on the battery. There's one other starting thing that was introduced in the 90s by Slick. It's a, a device called Slick Start. It's basically, um, it's STC'd for pretty much everything, it, 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 both Bendix mags and uh, Slick mags. The only thing it's not STC'd for is uh, is the dual mag, the, the evil dual mag, the D300 or D3000 rather. Um, but this is a kind of the same idea as the as the um, the, the Bendix uh, starting vibrator, except instead of being mechanical, it's solid state, and it generates a much higher uh, train of voltage pulses, so it generates a much hotter uh, spark. Um, so if you if you have starting problems, say you're operating in very cold weather and you've tried other things, um, retrofitting the slick start is 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 not a bad idea. It's pretty easy to put in, and it um, it's STC'd for both, you know, as I said, both uh, Bendix and slick mags, uh, other than the the dual mag. If you have the dual mag, you can't put this in. But it's a it's a it's a pretty good. Um, Unit um, again, it'll probably uh, be come obsolete when people start putting EISs in, in, in certified airplanes, and hopefully when the FAA relaxes their requirements a little bit um, uh, and allows us, allows us to put dual EISs in um, in in our aircraft in, in certified aircraft, which they presently aren't doing. They only allow one mag to be replaced. Um, another problem is that the the two EISs the, um, that are STC'd um, they they provide variable timing, which is really quite nice. And so they advance the timing when you're in, in cruise, and they provide quite a bit of fuel savings. But that feature does not work if the engine is turbocharged. Um, it, it's it all you have to have to disable the variable timing in a turbocharged engine. So um, that's the primary reason I haven't I haven't put one of these in my airplane because it's turbocharged and I'm waiting for one of them to come out with a a version that will 
provide variable timing in, in turbocharged engines. We're not we're not quite there yet. So Tim, that's uh, that's all I have, which was quite a lot. And uh, we can open it up for Q and A for whatever time that that we have available. Okay, Mark. Uh, Mark. Mark. She was us. Yeah. <laughs> Mike. <laughs> Oh boy. How long, how long to, have we known one another? <laughs> what a way to start out. Excuse me. <laughs> okay, let's jump into the question here. Uh, Mark's question. <laughs> what does it tell me if the engine runs systematically rougher on one specific mag side? Um, well, it could tell a number of things. Um, the, the, the hope is that you have a, an engine monitor and you can um, do some in-flight mag checks and dump the data and, and uh, you or we can take a look at it and try to figure out what's going on. It's, it's kind of hard to diagnose these things if you don't have an engine monitor. The engine monitors pay for them, pay for themselves in, in, in spades when you're trying to troubleshoot problems like this because uh, you can typically see exactly what the problem is, whether it's a spark plug, whether it's a lead, whether it's a mag problem. Um, so that's, um, you know, if the engine is running rough on one mag, it's it's probably not the mag. And the reason I say that and and again, I you know it would be nice to have a lot more data to look at. But the reason I say that is because running rough is a very distinctive uh, symptom, and it means that um, not all the cylinders are putting out the same amount of power. That that's that's what makes a piston engine run rough, is that different cylinders are putting out different amounts of power. Um, it's hard for a magneto to do that. There aren't many failure modes of magnetos that don't affect all cylinders equally. Um, but a, a, a bad spark plug can do that. And that's the, usually the most likely cause. And a, a bad ignition lead uh, can do that. So I would put the magneto kind of at the end of the suspect list. And I would focus on the spark plugs and the ignition harness. Uh, Based on what on what you told me, but again, if you have a digital engine monitor, and you can fly, you know, one of the flight test profiles that that, that we publish, and then uh, dump the data, you can tell an awful lot from the engine monitor about what's going on with the ignition system. Dominic says many people claim slick mags are not rebuildable. Are they or not? Well, they are. Um, the the it used to be uh, back before slick was acquired by Tampion that uh, that that slick had a very very attractive um, uh, exchange program where you could you could turn in your slick mag and, and get a um, an overhaul exchange mag at a at a very attractive price and it because of that program. Um, most people with slicks would would take advantage of that rather than having the uh, the mag uh, sent out. That program, the, at least the last time I looked, it was discontinued when Champion bought Slick from Unison, and I'm not aware that they've reinstated the, that that program. So uh, slicks are are now are kind of in the same boat as as Bendix mags, um, uh, I mean, you, you, you don't have this very attractive trade-in program from the manufacturer anymore, so mm -hmm. um, you can send it out to a, to a good mag shop and, and have them, uh, I wouldn't say rebuild it, it's a 500-hour IRAN. Rich is wondering, can you damage an impulse coupling by hand rotating the prop backwards? No, no, not at all. Um, the, 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 I think the confusion there is that there's, there's, um, some conventional wisdom that says you can damage, uh, dry vacuum pumps by turning the prop backwards. Um, I've been turning 
props backwards for years and I've never damaged a dry vacuum pump, so I don't really believe it, but that's there's that that's something that you hear said a lot. But no, there's no um, there's you can't damage your impulse coupling by turning the the thing backwards. Many people are kind of wondering this. Uh, I'll ask Gregory's. What if the RPMs do not drop during the mag check? Um, well, it, it probably means that the mag timing is wrong. Um, again, I, I I recommend that people have a digital engine monitor installed. And if you do have one, I I don't even recommend bothering to look at the tachometer during the mag check. I recommend looking at what happens to the EGTs during the mag check, which I think tells you a lot more. Um, the, the, this whole notion of uh, of doing a mag check and, and looking at how much the RPM drops is this very old fashioned thing back in the days when aircraft di didn't have, um, you know, probe per cylinder EGT information to look at. And all you could do is is look at what the, what the, the TAC was, was telling you. But if you do have an engine monitor, then I recommend that that's what you look at during the mag check. Not and don't don't worry too much about um, about RPM. But you know, generally speaking, if if the RPM doesn't drop during a mag check, um, you either have um, a hot mag, you have a broken P lead, so that when when you try to turn off the mag, it doesn't turn off, or you have um, a mag that's, that's significantly mistimed, yeah, typically very retarded, um, so that you don't get the you don't get very much drop when you turn off the mag. Um, and to follow up on that uh, Deborah's question, if the difference between left and right mag is great, say more than 50 RPM, what does that mean? Well, I mean, it typically means that the, the, the two mags are are different. It, it means that either the two mags are, are timed differently. Normally, for most engines, the two mags are supposed to be timed identically. Um, or it means that, you know, one of the two mags isn't putting out as much voltage as the other one, um, which can be caused by uh, the internal timing of the mag, which is something that is adjusted during the 500 hour inspection, uh, that the internal timing is off and the internal timing has to be correct in order for the mag to generate the, it's the maximum rated voltage that it's supposed to, that it's supposed to uh, generate. John is wondering, is there a time or years limit for inspecting the mags uh, vice the 500 hours? Um, well, again, the 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 500 hour thing is 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 a service bulletin, so it's not um, it's not compulsory for a, a Part 91 operator, um, but it's a very good idea. Um, the the Continental um, for their Bendix mags uh, asks you to to uh, do a 500 hour uh, inspection at 500 hours or four calendar years, whichever comes first. But it, you know, it's kind of like the 12 years on Lycoming engine. Most people just don't pay any attention to that. Um, Doug is wondering, um, what's your preference, rebuild or new mags? Well, uh, you know, first of all, um, you have to be careful with the terminology. Uh, rebuild, whether it's an engine or a magneto, um, rebuild can only be done by the original manufacturer. You can't send a mag or an engine out to a to a shop in the field and and have them rebuild the mag. That 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 word is often used incorrectly. But what you're asking them to do is either an IRAN, which is what the 500 hour uh, inspection calls for. Uh, Iran means inspect and repair as necessary. Or uh, you could be asking for an overhaul. Uh, overhaul does more stuff than uh, than than a um, Iran. And uh, the only time that you have to overhaul a mag is when the engine uh, gets major overhauled. 
then it's required that all of the components of the engine, including the magnetos, which are engine components, um, be overhauled. But the 500 hour thing is normally an IRAN. And the difference is that when you overhaul something, there's this long list of parts that have to be thrown out and replaced with new ones. When you do an IRAN, the, the, the shop or mechanic gets to look at all the parts and say, this looks okay, we'll keep, we'll keep it in service. This thing doesn't look okay, we'll change it. So the, you know, the, the, the guy who's doing the, the work, the, the IRAN has a lot of latitude and only has to do the stuff that he, that he thinks is necessary based on his assessment of the condition of the various parts. It's like, a, like the distributor gear, for example. Um, when, when you're doing an IRAN, you, you don't always replace the distributor gear. You only just replace the distributor gear if it looks you know, discolored or if it's got carbon tracking on it or there's some reason to, to replace it. Um, but when you overhaul a mag, then you have to replace the distributor gear. Uh, the same thing is true of the distributor block and, and lots of other parts. So um, asking for the mag to be overhauled is pretty much overkill for what, what you really need to do every 500 hours. You should really be asking for a 500 hour IRAN and that's what the service manual calls for. Joseph's wondering, how can we contend with a hot mag? Fix the broken p lead. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I don't understand the question. Maybe if he tries to turn off his key and it doesn't, and the engine doesn't I mean, turn there, off. There, there, are, there, there are some people, um, this isn't normally on most checklists, but there are some people that do a hot mag check at the end of a flight. They, they actually turn off the mag and see if the engine quits, um, which it obviously uh, shouldn't shouldn't do. Oh, no, if you turn off turn off the actually turn off both mags and see if the engine quits, and the engine should quit if you turn off both mags. Although that's not the recommended way to to stop the engine. Um, the recommended way is to pull the mixture control. But um, if if you you do a hot mag check by turning off both mags and and the engine should should quit, and um, if it doesn't, then then you've got a hot mag, and that means that there's a broken P lead, or I mean, it could be something wrong with the ignition switch. But most most often, it's a broken P lead, and it's usually broken at the end that connects to the magneto itself, because that's where all the vibration is. Jimmy's wondering why do you need mag filters on Bendix mags? You only need mag filters on pressurized mags. Um, pressurized mags are used on, on some turbocharged airplanes uh, that use small mags that would crossfire if you got up to high altitude up to the flight levels. And so to prevent them from crossfiring, they, um, they pressurize the mags. They run a, some, a tube from the turbocharger output, pressurized air from the turbocharger into both mags to, to pressurize the mags and to keep them at, at basically at sea level, um, even when you're up high. And um, because the, uh, the, the air that is, is compressed by the engine can have moisture and stuff in it, especially if you're flying through rain or whatever, they always run that pressurized air through a, through a mag filter before it goes to the two uh, pressurized magnetos. But you normally don't have filters on, on unpressurized mags. Robert's wondering, does shower of sparks require 20 full, 24 volt battery? Is no. higher battery voltage important? No, it doesn't. The, the, the shower of sparks mags are, um, are, are, are work on for both 12 volt systems and 24 volt systems. You, you use a different starting vibrator depending on which which voltage you're using, but um, but no, the shower sparks will work okay on a 12 volt system. Wendy wonders, can you mix and match shower of sparks magneto with other kind of magneto? Uh, that's a good question. I don't think I've ever seen anybody do that. It would be complicated because the the shower spark system uses a different kind of ignition switch than than um, 
than an impulse coupling magneto. So um, you, you couldn't use it, you know, a key operated switch to and 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 do that. Uh, you, you'd have to you'd have to use like individual toggle switches or something, which you probably don't want to do. I don't think I've ever seen anybody do a shower of sparks on one mag and, and a impulse coupling on the other. So Walt wonders, how often do magnetos fail? What well, does that compare to an electronic ignition system failure? You know, I, 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 I don't have good statistics on that, and I don't think anybody really does. But um, I'm going to talk a lot about failure modes of magnetos uh, next month. So I, I think it's probably just as well if we don't get into it now. Stay tuned really for next month. Talk, talking yeah. about it. Sounds good. Uh, William wonders, um, are mag checks, quote unquote, tough on the engine when flying multiple flights in the same day? Is it wise to tell a student, skip the mag check? Um, they're not particularly tough on the engine, no. Um, the the um, whether, whether, the, whether it's really necessary on every leg of a multi-leg flight, that, that's kind of up to the pilot. Um, I mean, I, I will always do a mag check on the first flight of the day. I won't always do a mag check on when I'm doing multiple flights during the day, but it's, it's really up to the pilot. But it's not, it's not tough on the engine. Okay. Samson is wondering, I've heard the term magnetron. Are they the same thing as a magneto? No, no. Magnetron is is a, a kind of um of uh vacuum tube that's that's used uh in microwave ovens and stuff like that it really doesn't have anything to oh. do with magneto at all uh clifton wonders on my champ 7ec should i start with only left mag rather than have the switch on both um well, I don't, I don't know what system you have set up, but no, there's no reason to do that. Um, if you have a a system with with two impulse couplings, then when you start the engine, both mags will be will, will be enabled. If you have an engine with one impulse coupling, the mag switch is a different style switch which will automatically ground out the right mag while you're starting on the, on the left mag. So from a pilot standpoint, you don't really have to worry about it. it, it it's kind of the way the, the, the airplane is wired. Mm -hmm. it, it does all of that stuff automatically. Matthew wonders, why do some mags sometimes make a quote unquote pop noise on startup? Uh, well, I'm not sure what he's referring to about a pop noise. The, 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 there's this clicking sound that the impulse couplings make um, when the, um, you know, when the, the the spring winds up and then the paw releases and the mag snaps. That makes an audible click. Um, but I'm I'm not sure what what sound he's really referring to. John wonders: Is mag cooling important? No, I've never really seen a case where magnetos um, ran hot and needed cooling air. Um, the the uh, actually the like I say the only mags that really have any air being pumped into them are the are pressurized mags that are used in turbocharged airplanes to prevent high altitude misfire. James is wondering, do right mags run top or bottom plugs? Um, well, it depends. On Continental engines, it's it's pretty simple. The um, uh, each mag fires the top plugs on its side of the engine, and the bottom plugs on the opposite side of the engine. And I think every Continental engine is the same way. Um, so the right mag would would fire the top plugs on the right bank of cylinders and the bottom plug on the left bank of cylinders. Light combings, I, um, I think, um, have more variation as to how the ignition harness is, is set up. I don't think they're all 
um, set up the same way, the way all continentals are. Um, so you have to look at the at the manual to get a picture of of how the harness is 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 set up. Harley's wondering, do you think the FAA will ever allow both mags on a certificated aircraft to be removed and replaced with electronic ignition? I, I, yeah, I do. Um, it's just, you know, because it's the FAA, it just is going to happen at a snail's pace. But yeah, of course, I think, I mean, it's, it's kind of crazy that we are still using those old magnetos, uh, in, in my view. and. Um, you know the that emag that I showed you a picture of that that is used a lot in in uh, experimentals. That's actually a self exciting mag. It, it doesn't it doesn't depend on uh, ship's power at all. It, it generates its own voltage. Um, and uh, you know if that mag were available for certificated aircraft, I, I think it would probably be possible to talk the FAA into it. But the emag guys don't seem to have any interest in spending the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars it would take to to get their their mag certified so they have just always focused on the experimental market and not not uh, gone through the the certification hassle what well, what's really needed i think is for the faa to revamp part 33 and and, and make it a lot easier to uh, to get new technology certified in the engine area than it is now what's part 33 that's the part of the I talked about it at the very beginning. Uh, that's the um, that's the part of the regulations that has to do with with certifying engines. Uh, it's it, part 23 is for certifying small airplanes. Part 25 is for certifying big airplanes. Part 33 is for certifying engines. And part 23 got recently revamped and completely re redone and kind of dragged into the 21st century, but part 33 hasn't been changed in a long, long, long time. Mm. Mark is wondering, why is one of my megs timed at 26 and the other at 28? It's an engine um, for 1967 Cessna 172 with a Continental O300D. Um, you know, I can't, I, I don't know the answer to that. I have seen a few engines that have a spec that call for the two mags to be timed slightly differently. The vast majority of engines, um, the spec is that both mags are timed the same. I, I can't tell you exactly why um, on your engine it's spec that way to have split, what we call split timing. Hmm. Kelly wonders, should the mags be timed at every condition inspection each year? Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, it doesn't take very long to do it. You just hook a buzz box to it and uh, put a, a digital inclinometer on the propeller, and you, you you measure, you know, the exactly where the the points on the mags open, and uh, they should be within a degree, no more than a degree from what the spec says, um, preferably um, plus zero and minus one degree uh, from from what the the spec says. And if they aren't, you just need to loosen the magneto clamps and rotate the magneto a, a, a tad to get the timing to be correct. It's, it doesn't take very long. Hmm. Uh, Alex wonders, is it worth upgrading one mag to electronic and one to mechanical? Um, well, I, I think it is at this point. Um, uh, we've got a lot of clients that have done that. And they all seem to be pretty happy uh, with it, and they all seem to be getting um, improved fuel economy because of the variable timing. Um, so it, to me, it's, it's kind of makes sense. As I said, the only reason that I haven't done it on my airplane is because uh, I have a turbocharged airplane, and they haven't yet figured out how to get the variable timing to work with turbocharged airplanes. But um, yeah, if I had a normally aspirated engine, I, I would probably give serious consideration to putting one of the EISs on. William wonders, um, is wondering how much fuel savings do you get with the EIS? And you just answered that. He also says, do you use the same lean of peak procedures? Yes. Uh -huh. 
Okay. And William wonders, is it true the mags won't fire when the prop is pulled through backwards? Um, if it's, um, if it is a, uh, an impulse coupling system, then the mags will not fire when you pull the prop through backwards because the impulse coupling is a one directional thing and it won't, it won't do its little snapping number if you're turning the prop backwards. So uh, the engine won't start if you're turning it backwards. Um, shower of sparks, it would be a lot more risky, but the, 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 the shower of sparks system doesn't generate any voltage unless you are holding the start switch in the start position, which you normally wouldn't be doing if you were moving the propeller by hand. So I, I don't really think there's, there'd be any risk with shower of sparks either, unless you were pulling the prop backwards and somebody was in the cockpit pushing the you know, putting in or, or turning the key switch to start, which is kind of unlikely. Lyle's wondering what happens to the energy that goes into the capacitor? What happens to it? Yeah. It, it discharges through the, through the coil. And Steve wants to know, and a few people have asked this about AMPs. Steve's wondering, as an AMP, can can I I ran my own mags legally? Yes, you can. I I, I did mine myself for years. I have, I have four S twelve hundreds on my airplane, so it would take me like a half a day to do it. Um, lately, I've gotten lazy and I've been sending them out. But uh, but no, it's it's absolutely legal for an AMP to. To, to Iran the mags. Joel wonders if you run one electronic ignition and one mag, should you rotate plugs occasionally? Um, if if the plugs are the same kind, uh, some EISs call for using uh, plugs that have a a much wider gap uh, than what will work on the mags, and that makes ro rotating them kind of hard because they the gaps aren't the aren't the same between the EIS spark plugs and the magneto spark plugs. Uh, if the system uses the same spark plugs for, for both the magneto and the EIS system, then yeah, you would, it would be a good idea to rotate them. Okay, let's see here. Getting to the end of the questions. A lot of questions were kind of redundant a little bit. Um, Joe duplicative. is, pardon me? I said duplicative. Duplicative, okay. Uh, <laughs> Joe is wondering, can the single drive dual mags be timed differently? No. And and the, they, they only have a, a single uh, impulse coupling driving both mags. So if the, if the impulse coupling failed, it would take out both mags. The, the other thing that we see with the dual mags, which isn't very good, is if the if the clamps that that hold the mag in in position on the back of the engine start vibrating loose, and the mag rotates, it 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 puts both mags out of time instead of just one. Mm -hmm. So th there there are a bunch of reasons why I'm not a big fan of the of the dual mag, but it is what it is. And Casey's wondering, does the impulse coupling affect the procedure for timing the engine? No. No, it, it, it does not. Uh, let's see here. So Tom's wondering, does the impulse coupling disengage once the engine is started, or is it there? Is there wear and tear on the spring post-start? No, it, dis it disengages the those um, those fly weights um, are are designed so that when the engine is turning uh, ab above the mags coming in speed, uh, centrifugal force um, pulls the fly weights where they can't engage the the stop pin, and so there's once the engine is turning at decent RPM, the 
the impulse couplings kind of go out of the, they they become rigid couplings they don't keep winding up the spring um, when you shut the engine down the last few blades you will often hear the impulse coupling snap as the engine is turning really really slow and there's not enough centrifugal force to uh, to pull the flyweights out of the way but when the engine is running at any kind of reasonable rpm you know idle or anything above that the uh, the centrifugal force uh, causes the flyweights to pull out of the way, and, and it's, it's it's actually a pretty clever system, really. So, a few people are wondering, um, what EGT temperature change would you expect on a mag check? Uh, normally, we expect to see somewhere between 50 and 100 degrees Fahrenheit rise of EGT when the engine goes into single mag operation. And what we normally see, I had a, a really good slide of this, um, that what we usually see is, uh, uh, is that when you operate on one of the mags, uh, the, you know, the odd ones rise more than the even ones. And then when you switch to the other mag, the odd ones rise less than the even, the even ones rise more. So there's some asymmetry between the odds and evens when when uh, when you do a mag check. Well, Mike, we've gotten to the end of uh, just a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. It looks like we had over 1,800 people logged in. From my memory, oh. that's an all-time record. So I thank you, so. everyone, for joining us. This is just wonderful. Yep. Um, Mike, take a moment and share your closing thoughts. Okay. Well, we're, we're gonna we're gonna do. Uh, more mag stuff uh, next month. We're gonna talk about failure modes of mags and so on, and what pilots can, can do when, when a mag acts up. Um, you know, my books are all available, uh, at Amazon, EAA, Aircraft Spruce, and between now and February 8th, they're, they're being marked down at the EAA bookstore, so that would be a, a good place to, uh, to, to get them. Um, this is, uh, oh yeah, the, our, uh, uh, this website called Book Authority, which, which lists the, the best books of various categories. They have the 63 best aircraft maintenance books of all time. And the number one, two, and three are, were, were all my books. So I was pretty happy about that. And, um, I'm working on audio books. The, uh, manifesto is already, is, is done and it's now available through Audible uh, and also uh, um, if you go on Amazon, it will, and you, you, want, you say you want the audio book, it'll link you to Audible. Um, and I'm working on Engines now. Engines is a big giant book that's more than 500 pages long. So that's gonna be a pretty long project to get that in audio book, but that's, that's what I'm uh, working right now. And uh, yeah, that's the, that's the manifesto on the Audible page. Um, upcoming webinars um, in March, we're going to be talking about how mags fail, as I, as I said, kind of the, 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 the bookend to what we just talked about in this webinar. Um, in April, um, I have a webinar called How Risky is Maintenance, and uh, it, it goes through an FAA study that, that tried to figure out how often aircraft accidents are caused by um, something a mechanic did and tried to figure out, you know, what sorts of mechanic tricks cause accidents and that sort of thing. So we're, we're going to be going through that. It's pretty interesting. Um, and um, in May, uh, I'm doing a webinar called Annual Deadlock, which is a sort of a sad story of an aircraft owner who got his airplane, put his airplane in for annual inspection and everything that could have possibly gone wrong went wrong. So there's some lessons learned from from his his misery. We'll be talking about that uh, in May, and uh, that's it. That's him. That's all I got. Really well, thank you. That we had this kind of turnout. That's wonderful. It is wonderful. Thank you all so much for joining us. And uh, remember, we got three thousand people we can accommodate, so we got a lot of room to grow yet. Please share this with your friends and let them know that these EAA webinars are 
are free to everyone. And uh, based upon comments, uh, a lot of people saying great presentation, awesome, really appreciate it. Um, you know, excellent. Uh, thank you so much for the education. So based on that, Mike, uh, you did a great job tonight. Thank you so much. Uh, I know you're not feeling 100%, so I really want to thank you for, for powering through this. I would have never known it, but uh, go to bed, uh, get some rest, and hope you feel better. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm going straight to bed. I've, I've had, I woke up with a really bad tummy ache, and it's been kind of a miserable day, but uh, I'm feeling better now, and I'm sure I'll feel I'm back to 100% in the morning. Yeah, 1,800 of your friends just got done listening to you and are sending you their well wishes, I'm sure. Yeah, so, so our, take care. Our, our, our next big milestone is 2,000, huh? Right on. All right. We're, <laughs> re We're ready for it. We're in Um Yeah. Thank you all so much for joining us. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thanks, everybody.